Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. It is I, Sierra Daredevil, back with another episode in our WCW What If series in TW9. Uh, we're going to be doing something slightly different with this episode, um, which I'll explain in a second. But first, it is two weeks out from Spring Stampede 1998, where we don't really have a whole lot of matches finalized at this point, but a lot of matches that seem like they're finalized at this point. Um, and more than likely this week, we will see some finalizations of some matches for that show. Cause obviously with it being what, uh, at the time where I'm getting ready to book and then record nitro, uh, obviously it would be, um, beneficial to be able to promote the pay-per-view 13 days out with some actual matches. So there's that. Um, now my slight thing for this episode and it might be something I start doing heading forward I have to see one how much all of you watching uh, like it and to see because uh, it is going to add a little bit to my um, preparing these videos thing so I, I would have to do that but here's what we're going to be doing uh, for this episode for sure and possibly for some episodes heading forward until enough people say hey don't do this um so in TW9, for those who are unaware, uh, so in, in TW 2020, when you went to go book a show, uh, you just you set up the place you're going to, um, and then you just started booking. You didn't really have a whole lot of pre-show stuff. In TW9, you do have pre-show stuff. You do have, like, not pre-show, like, you know, matches before the show, but, like, stuff you do before you can, before you can start booking the show. So we're going to start featuring those in these um just to kind of see you know just so you guys can see like what might be popping up um especially because in the other episodes i've done in the um the aw1 uh and the tna one over there was some kind of interesting stuff that popped up so uh we're gonna be doing that for this one and we're gonna start doing it for all of our episodes heading forward until you know until you guys get tired of it, I guess. But anyway, so we're starting off. Um, it says we're booking Saturday night. You guys are not going to see Saturday night. Again, this, Saturday night at this point for me is just, I just throw on one match that's usually between, you know, an un, unimportant people, or maybe I'll throw on a recognizable person who I don't have any plans for that week to take on somebody, uh, and then just a few promos. It's, it's literally just my um, C show at this point, basically. Um, it has like no meaning to anything story wise. It's just, you know, some promos building people up and all that. But because we book, because I book it the same night as Nitro, that's why this comes up first. So as you see, here's the list of stuff we can do. Uh, we can give the workers night off some, the night off over. So that way some of them can work for other companies that might employ them. I, in this series, I'm probably not going to do this over in the TNA series. Uh, and the AEW series, I have started doing that with some of them because there are some workers who, you know, I don't plan on using that night that, um, do so work for other companies that might be able to work those shows. So I haven't really done it for that. You don't really have to, for those who haven't played this one, you don't really have to do this. Um, it doesn't really change much. It just allows them to be available somewhere else because most of the time, especially if you're, you know, WCW in this save, um, since I'm the number one company, everybody's going to show, everybody's going to want to work for me. Um, and so if I don't give them the night off, then they're not going to be available to work somewhere else. So, you know, um, so in TNA and the AW saves, I've been kind of doing that a little bit, which you'll start to see heading forward over, but with this, I'm not doing that. So, uh, select tonight's venue or location. We're going to be going to the Southwest because it's been a little while since we've been there. Um, and uh, we're expected 20,049 people. Arrowhead Pond would be the best one. Okay. Uh, the broadcasters automatically get finalized because it's a TV show. There was no pre-show incidents, which is good. Booking team, um, it gets skipped for B-shows. Right now in this series, I'm the only person on the book. And you'll see it for Thunder. Um, I'm the only booker uh, at this point, so it doesn't really matter. 
I might, well, I, I don't know for sure if this pops up for Nitro. If it does pop up for Nitro 2, even though we're booking them on the same night, then I'll probably go through it with this, but locker room incidents. Vic Grimes has turned up and asked if you might if you might be able to use him tonight. He's an employed worker who happens to live nearby. He has not worked for WCW before. He's 35 years old, does not have a defined personality. He has no relationships. Um, he's a worker. He's a wrestler. Oof. I mean, to be fair, if I brought him in, it wouldn't be for much anything anyway. You have 45 stamina. That's rough. Uh, better as a heel. So I could bring you in for my match and have a face go over you as a local talent. I could do that. Um, it would just be a bad match regardless. You know what? We're just going to say, sorry, there's no spots available. Um, I don't really have a... I, I might... If I'm going to go find a local talent, it's probably going to be somebody who's better than that. Bison Smith wants to be allowed to hang out backstage. Unemployed worker who happens to live nearby. He's not worked for WCW before. He has no relationships. I don't know why he's hanging out backstage. He's professional, at least. Um, yeah, I don't know... New kid on the block, I guess. I don't know why he's wanting to hang out backstage, but I don't see a problem with it. So, yeah, sure, why not? Hang out backstage. Meng came up, came to you backstage and said he thinks Lance Storm has a bright future and he'd be willing to put him over to help take him to the next level. This offer is good for two matches and will expire July 5th of 1998. So we have two, three months for that. Okay, I... That's going to be weird because they're both heels, but I could make something work for that, I guess. So that's something. Tommy Dreamer and Rocky Vianvia helped create, helped, or really helped create a fun and relaxed atmosphere backstage after somehow finding a karaoke machine and starting an impromptu pre-show competition. Their over-the-top duet was a highlight, according to those in attendance. All right. Ric Flair came back, came to you backstage with an angle idea. Has it been automatically added to your stored creative ideas? Okay. Uh, Diamond Dallas Page is our head men's trainer, and he ran pre-show training drills to work on basics and safety for Rocky Maivia, Billy Kidman, Sexton Hardcastle, and Ron Killings. Those are the four men that are getting trained at this point. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Ricky Shivatu and Samu are now travel buddies. That makes sense. They are the tag team. All right. There's that. Uh, and then address the locker room. Um, I have started doing, and you know, you can do any of the other ones, but I've started doing this team bonding one because building up like relationships uh, between ourselves, the major stars, stars, and the locker room leaders can sometimes be a good thing. So there you go. We've strengthened the relationship between Eddie and Flair, between Austin and Pillman, between Austin and Piper, between us and Raven, between Flair and Sting, between Malenko and Piper, between Pillman and Bigelow, and between Cactus and Dustin Rhodes. Interesting. All right. That's cool. All right. So we will see you in a second for either the pre-stuff for Nitro or for Nitro itself. So, as it turns out, there is a... Um, uh, brief little pre-thing. Um, it does automatically skip over the venue because we've already done that as well as the night off. Uh, but booking team meeting, we, as Eric Bischoff, generated a total of 120 creative uh, energy um, because we have a booking skill of 90, so we created 80, and then we received a 50% concentration bonus for working alone, which got to 120. Um which brings our stored total up to 192. Uh, Nitro uses 40, so we're at 152 right now. Um, I might start using that here soon, but we'll see. I also might be, I was also kind of looking at it. I might be bringing on somebody else in the booking uh, thing to start really getting a bunch of creative energy. Um, because looking at it, 
Dustin Ro Dustin Dusty Rhodes, who is a uh, road agent for us, as well as a color commentator. I think he might still be a color commentator, but anyway, um, he's a road agent for us, and he's got really great he's got a really great booking skill, and so I think maybe him and Bischoff would work well as a booking team, and be able to start using creative energy a lot more, so we can start spending it on some of this stuff. Not that we really need to at this point, but there are a few things. Uh, especially um, not necessarily create a finish or angle idea because I'm not super worried about those. Maybe the angle ideas if I'm trying to do like a, you know, smaller promo, uh, smaller, not smaller, but a, like a lower tier promo, um, you know, someone like a Alex Wright promo who isn't super great talking wise right now that could possibly boost that. But I'm kind of looking more at the like the last three, the gimmick idea um, in case I change people's gimmicks. Uh, storyline idea which would be helpful for some of my more um, mid card or lower storylines and then the character idea which would help I don't necessarily need to boost some workers morale right now but adding depth to a workers character could be pretty good but anyway so there's that we did that locker room incidents for Nitro uh, Mickey J our referee and Al Snow have been getting on particularly well recently all right Al Snow hanging out again along with the referee cool and that's it. That's it. All right. We'll see you in just a second for Nitro. All right. We open up Nitro in front of 17,116 people at the Arrowhead Pond in Anaheim, California. Uh, this was supposed to have a description for the angle, and for some reason it just decided not to. So uh, essentially what we have here is Brian Pillman um, and Ric Flair come out to the ring, and Pillman's still kind of disappointed. He's disappointed about them losing to Sudden Impact. And Flair says, listen, man, it, you know, it happens. It happens. You know, it, you, you lose a few matches here and there. It's fine. You're going to get back to the world title soon enough. You know, you got to stop letting this get you down. You know, you got so much, you're getting, you're having all these issues right now. You've got so much against you right now. You just got to turn things around. You be the, be the top star here in WCW that I know you are. And Kurt Henning comes out and says, listen, this whole thing with this whole weird little you being a hype man for Pillman is kind of pathetic. It's kind of weak and pathetic, Flair. And that if uh, that you're sitting here boring these people time and time again, nobody gives a damn. Nobody gives a damn about any of this stuff. We want to, you know, we I nobody wants to see your old ass anymore, Ric Flair. And as for Pillman, well, you, uh, you, if you're gonna sit here and act like a little whiny baby, then maybe you should just go home. And Flair loses his mind about it, and after a little bit of back and forth, it ends up being that at Spring Stampede, it's going to be Brian Pillman and Ric Flair teaming up against Kurt Henning and a partner of his choosing. We don't know who his partner is quite yet. Got a 91. Um, Ric Flair had a creative thing for an angle, and it came up as a failure. Despite the fact that it was the that it was said it was... I don't remember the exact wording, it, but it said like basically a guarantee, uh, basically a guaranteed success or something like that. And it still failed. So that's fun. Um, but yeah, 83 for the first part, 89 for the second part. But uh, yeah, so we have a match at Spring Stampede where it's going to be Brian Pillman and Ric Flair against Kurt Henning and a mystery partner. We'll have to see who that mystery partner ends up being. It's got a 91 though. Then our opening contest sees Booker T defeat Lance Storm in 13 and a half minutes when Lance Storm was DQ'd after Chris Jericho ran and attacked Booker T. 82 rating for the match. Good stuff there. 62 from Storm, 81 from Booker. Lost heat for the sword line. Not worried about it. We'll get that heat back. But there you go. Nice uh, 13 and a half minute match to open up Nitro and it sees Booker get the win. Um, it's funny, like, I always feel weird sitting here and doing these longer matches on Nitro because, of course, in real life, Nitro never had like hardly ever had that long of matches, especially in 1998. But if, you know, it's always kind of funny where I always do like a couple longer matches on nitros because I don't like the idea of doing like 10 matches, but they're all like three minutes a piece. If that, especially because TW would not like if I did that either. Um, but you know, good match up here that sees Booker get the win, even though it was by DQ. Thanks to Jericho's attack. Speaking of Jericho, by the way, uh, it gets announced during this matchup that he is in the main event against Dean Malenko. 
So that should be a very interesting matchup there. Then we have a 50 rated segment backstage where Big Bubba Rogers is still trying to talk to Miss Alexandra York after their recent issues. Uh, but she seems to be distracted with Shane Helms once again, kind of talking him up, saying, you know, we need to get you a shot at the Cruiserweight title and all this stuff. Rogers gets in her face, though, demanding to be heard, demanding to, you know, says, hey, I'm, you know, you need to be respecting me. I'm the one that's helping carry this team. I'm the one that's been getting Shane to where he is right now. Um, but Helms gets in his face for getting in York's face, tells him to calm down. And York says that they both need to get on the same page because they have a tag match on Thunder this week. So Big Bo Rogers and Shane Helms will be taking on somebody at a tag team matchup. We don't know who their opponents are yet. Um, but uh, we'll have to see if those issues continue. 50 rated segment here. We get an 87 rated segment as Sting and Bear Wind come out. Too good, Bob. Uh, Sting gets a microphone. Um, Wyndham doesn't really talk during this at all. Uh, got an 87. As Sting talks about Bam Bam Bigelow and Diamond Dallas Page, seemingly wanting a shot at the WCW World Tag Team Championships, when they've been a tag team for maybe a cup of coffee at best. Sting and Wyndham don't back down from a challenge, that's for sure. However, the Fowler Tag Champions, Jerry Lynn and Sean Waltman, also seem to want to match for the titles, and they're actually ranked in the tag division. Uh, so Bigelow and Page may have to wait while Sting and Wyndham defend the titles against Lynn and Waltman at Spring Stampede. So, it does get revealed that tag titles are on the line at Spring Stampede. Jerry Lynn and Sean Wallman getting a title shot against Sting and Barry Windham. We'll have to see how that ends up playing out, especially because we'll have to see what Bigelow and Page have to say about that. We got Taz warming up backstage before his matchup when he gets approached by Tommy Dreamer. Taz looks like he is going to fight with Dreamer, but Dreamer is like, hey, hey, I'm not here for a fight. I just want to know if you thought more about what I talked to you about before. Taz doesn't really say anything, though. He's clearly focused on his upcoming fight. So Dreamer just kind of sighs before he said, well, just keep thinking about it before he walks away. So 51 here. Taz goes out to the ring for a match with Mark Marrow, and they get a 71. Suffer from a lack of psychology. That's fine. It was an eight-minute matchup, by the way, and it suffered from a lack of psychology. That's something. <laughs> but Taz defeats Mark Marrow in 757 by submission with a Taz mission. 71 for the match. 77 from Taz, 70 from Mark Marrow. Yeah, I'm really surprised that it suffered from a lack of psychology. Like, I know their psychology isn't that good. That's part of the reason why the match was short. But, like, suffering from a lack of psychology in an eight-minute matchup? Like, oof. Um, but Taz gets the victory. Uh, clean victory there as Mark Merrill continues kind of falling down the, the ladder here in WCW. Um, despite his in-ring performance is still being good. But he's uh, he's still kind of struggling ever since he lost to... You know, ever since he the whole thing with trying to take out the flock failed him, he's uh he's been kind of struggling a little bit. So we'll have to see what ends up happening with that. Whereas Taz is just continuing his undefeated streak here in in uh in WCW and uh still looking strong, working his way up the uh up the ladder here in WCW, so to speak. After that we have a 79 rated segment that sees Kurt Henning and apparently his ta his mystery tag team partner Jeff Jarrett attacking Ric Flair backstage before Brian Pillman runs in to chase them off. 79 rating, as it does become official that Jeff Jarrett is Kurt Henning's opponent or partner. So that'll be the tag match at Spring Stampede. Kurt Henning and Jeff Jarrett versus Ric Flair and Brian Pillman. But Flair is obviously a little bit weak. He's kind of beamed up right now, heading potentially into that matchup. So... I mean, granted, we're 13 days out, so he should be able to recover by then, but we'll have to see what ends up happening. Then after that, Raven comes out to the ring, talks about the darkness that exists in everyone, because it's kind of a more typical Raven promo. Uh, people could pretend to be happy and positive, but the truth is that they all suffer, because this world is all about suffering, and Raven knows all about that. He also knows how to cause suffering, and if Chris Benoit really wants a match with Raven for this WCW United States Championship, Benoit will find out what suffering truly is. This, of course, brings out Chris Benoit to a big pop. Benoit charges the ring, starts brawling with Raven, getting the better of him. Uh, Meng comes out to try to help out Raven, but Benoit kind of sees him coming and is able to hit a suicide dive to the outside, kind of staggering Meng back some. Um, not knocking him off his feet, because, you know, we're playing off the idea that Meng is too, too tough to be knocked off his feet by that. But uh, it staggers him back enough that Benoit is able to leave the ringside area um, and avoid having to be in a two-on-one situation. As Meng is pissed while Raven slowly recovers in the ring. 80 rating. Good stuff there for that. 
kind of building up that storyline. Ron Simmons and Rocky Maivia are standing by backstage. It's 53. That's what it is. Uh, Maivia is disappointed after losing to Mang on Thunder. But Simmons tells him, you know, it's all right. You'll uh, you'll learn that use that as a learning experience and be able to take care of Ming in the future when Simmons defends the WCW Television Championship against Al Snow. Simmons tells Snow to figure out when he wants the beating he deserves from Simmons because as the champion, Simmons is offering a title match to him. Because remember, technically Jeff Jarrett is the number one contender for the Television Championship right now, but uh, the champion can issue a title match can can uh, choose to defend the title against anybody in the top five, and Al Snow is in the top five. So Simmons is offering a title match to Al Snow. He just has to see when Al Snow finally wants that match to happen. Spoilers, it's not going to happen at Spring Stampede. I'm trying to keep the television championship as more of a television-based title. So it's probably either going to be on a Nitro or a Thunder. It won't be on Spring Stampede. Then we have a Wild Brawl. That's okay. <laughs> I'll have to figure out something with that. As Jesus Castillo Jr. defeats Samu in 722 by pinfall the missile dropkick, 66 rating for the match. Of course, this is stemming from these two tag teams recently having issues with each other, the Caribbean Express and Fatu and Samu. Um, and Jesus is able to get the victory over Samu here on Nitro. Uh, Jesus and Miguel Perez Jr. are an awkward pairing, so Miguel apparently can't manage Jesus, otherwise we're going to get this awkward pairing thing heading forward so that's fun uh i might just have to keep you know i might just have to keep putting him at ringside but not actually have him as a manager um but anyway this guy's 66 uh, gained heat for the storyline so that's kind of the main that's kind of the main focus of that i don't expect you know i'm not expecting this this mat you know these matches and story and this storyline to be like a really great one but it's a way to to get these four used um get them some popularity and help fill the cards as well so but uh, yeah, Caribbean Express getting one up on Fatu and Samu. We'll have to see what is happening with that heading forward. Yeah, thank you. Miguel Makuto is standing by backstage. Talks to everyone, uh, or talks about everyone asking her about Dean Malenko's recent a- attitude. She says she brought another comment about that, but says as the only t- two-time WCW Women's World Champion, she will be watching the match between Miyu Miyazaki and Medusa for the title very closely. It is also revealed that that match will be happening in Spring Stampede. It will be Miyu Miyazaki and Medusa fighting for the WCW Women's World Championship. So Medusa finally, you know, getting a, a title shot again. Can she finally win that championship? She's had a few title shots in the past. She has failed every single one of them. Can she finally get the victory this time around? We'll have to see. 48 rating for this. Uh, advance the storyline there. Kudo's usually a little bit better at a promo, so I'm kind of confused, but whatever. We get Dustin Rhodes backstage, and he walks into Roddy Piper's office. Piper's on the phone, but tells whoever he's talking to that you'll talk to him later before hanging up. Rose wants to know what the deal is booking Cactus Jack versus Steve Austin for the WCW World Title at Spring Stampede, another match that is official. You may be wondering, well, Daredevil, why are you like all of a sudden putting 15 matches? Well, not 15, but why are you suddenly making all of these matches official for Spring Stampede? One, we're 13 days out. Uh, and two, the idea is that um, a couple of these were kind of like revealed by uh a commercial that was advertised not that it was like oh man this is the way you find out but it's like it's it's one it's some of those where it's like it's obvious that that match was going to be made official and so it it gets revealed as being official via a commercial you know advertisements for it anyway piper says that austin requested the match and the cactus agreed to it as well because of course remember steve austin did request on thunder he said you know if cactus wants a match at spring stampede he's more than welcome to apparently cactus agreed to it so they're gonna have the title match at spring stampede Dustin says that the only person who should get that title shot, who should be getting a title shot, that is, is him. Piper says that Dustin can have a title shot whenever he wants. He just has to cash in his World War III opportunity. And for some reason, I didn't put a space between War and Three. Whatever. Uh, Rhodes says that he shouldn't have to cash in that, cash that in to get a title shot, and may need to show Piper just what he means by that. Before Piper can ask what that means, Rhodes leads the office. So, Dustin Rhodes he feels like he deserves a world title match without having to cash in his World War Three opportunity. And he's not happy about the fact that Cactus is getting the shot before him. So we'll have to see what ends up happening with that. Of course, Cactus Jack has also recently been having issues with the, the New World Order. Coming to Eddie Guerrero and Two Cold Scorpio's aid recently. So we'll have to see, you know, is Cactus going to be spreading himself a little too thin with uh, trying to fight for the world title while also dealing with the New World Order. Who knows? 92 rating for this segment, though. 
Then before our main event, we get a 92 rated segment that sees Chris Jericho standing by backstage before the main event and says that he showed that loser Booker T earlier what's going to happen, what's going to continue to happen while this conspiracy continues here in WCW. And tonight he's going to defeat the former U.S. champion Dean Malenko to prove that he's still deserving, that he should be the one getting the shot at the WCW World Heavyweight Championship instead of those in charge continuing to hold him back from that opportunity. He kind of briefly talks about how Cactus shouldn't be getting that opportunity, it should be him, and that he's going to use tonight's main event to prove that he deserves a shot at the title. And tonight's main event gets a 92 rating. Uh, unfortunately, Jericho does not use this as an opportunity to prove that he deserves a world title match because, thanks to Booker T running in and attacking Jericho when the referee was distracted, Dean Malenko defeats Chris Jericho in 1545 by submission with the Texas Cloverleaf. 92 rating for the match. Crowd was at a 90. Wrestling is at an 89. Wow, the crowd is actually hotter for this match than the wrestling. That's kind of crazy. Jericho with a 91. Malenko with an 87. Malenko is like off his game, it seems like. That's weird. Oh, no! Come on! Damn it. <laughs> Transferring over from the old game to this game has given us Dean Malenko declining physically, which means he's get, his stats are going to start going down and he's going to start getting closer to retirement here in the next year or two. That sucks. Um, I mean, obviously his stats are are great enough right now that it probably won't be super noticeable for at least another year or so. Like, he'll still probably be able to start, unless he starts, like, really dropping numbers. Um, he'll probably still be kind of doing mid to upper 80 in-ring performances for a while. But, God, that sucks. He's declining at this point. Um, I still might do my plans for him, but I don't know for sure about that now. I'm not going to spoil what they are because in case I do end up still doing it, but I did have plans for him in the future that are going to have to either be quickened like I had to do with Diamond Dallas Page or they're going to have to be uh, changed completely. If I end up dropping the plans, I'll let you know what they are, but that sucks. That really sucks. Nevertheless... Dean Malenko with the victory over Chris Jericho, thanks to Booker T attacking Jericho. And Nitro gets to 91, increasing our popularity, 13 regions. Good stuff there. Uh, financial report. We, we, this is just showing you how much money we're making at this point. Like, we have so much money, it's not even funny. We just made almost $2 million off of just Nitro and Saturday Night. Because Saturday Night was taped before Nitro. So we made almost $2 million from both of those shows. That's not even Thunder either. So that just shows you how much money we're making at this point, hand like hand over fist. So at this point, we're probably going to start offering a lot higher contracts to people for one. Um, but I'm also going to start looking at other stuff I can boost up at this point. Because we're just making way too much money at this point now. So I got to figure out something. Because we have $202 million now. So I got to figure out something for it. Popularity recap. Um, so all of Europe went up one, so that's really cool. Uh, New Zealand went up, went not up a full point, but it did go up. And Mexico, it looks like we did gain one full point. Um, in Surest, Surest, I'm not sure how to say that, but that one, and then a couple other regions in Mexico, we gained at least part of a point. So that's cool. Um. But yeah, we, uh, you know, there's Nitro in the books. Um, God, that's, that sucks with Dean Malenko. I wasn't expecting that one. I should check and see. I mean, obviously I'd have to make, I have to say I have to put him in a match first so I can see the, the dirt sheet. But I wonder if Page's decline transferred over. Because that'd be hilarious if Diamond Dallas Page is no longer declining physically. That'd be hilarious. Um, all right, so let's look at this stuff real quick. First off, why did this not? Yeah, why did that not save that? That's weird. Um, so on the night, seven point one million people watching Nitro. What the hell? 
Man, that must have really been adjusted from the previous game to this one. I guess that does make sense. I do remember them saying, I do remember it being in the notes that they were going to adjust the TV uh, stuff more accordingly, I think it was. Um, so only 7.1 million people watching now. Uh, Raw wasn't done for some reason, though. Oh, because this would have this happened after. So when I started the save in this one, in this, it started on Wednesday, I think it was. Yeah. And so it would have been after Raw would have been taped for this week. So technically we go on a pose this week just because of switching over from one game to the next. CML had an 82. Rey Mysterio Jr. was not in the main event, and that's why they only had an 82. Uh, ECW had a 74, which is good for them. Terry Funk and Taz defeated Special Edition, which is one main gang in Sandman. Uh, I think they pre yeah they taped this on Saturday, so that's why Taz was featured. So Taz technically was on two shows in one night. <laughs> Hell yeah, Taz pulling a Rick Rude. <laughs> I mean, he's still working for both of them because we're, you know, we have a deal with ECW, but it's still just kind of funny. It's like, oh, Taz was in the main event there and he also wrestled on Nitro, man. He's getting super over. Um, I don't know if BCW. <laughs> Don Callis. That's awesome. Uh, I was going to say, I don't know if BCW is doing much of anything to look at. They did. They got Mike Rotunda, former IRS. Yeah, a 42 in-ring performance there. That's part of the reason why he's no longer with WCW anymore. Um, let's see. Anything of note here? Scott Hall's going to start a feud with the Warrior. Uh, Taker and Michaels are going to start feuding. Yeah, it's basically like the same five or six people that they just have feud with each other every single time now. Um, but yeah, there's that. Uh, there's not really much else to look at for Nitro here, so... This is a longer one. This whole video is going to be super long, which I apologize for. But let's, uh, you know, we'll see you in just a second for Thunder. All right, time to look at the pre -sh stuff for Thunder. Uh, we're not giving anybody the night off. Then you are going to focus on the Tri-State area. Um, I might consider running shows again somewhere nearby soon, but... Uh, apparently it shows MSG for us. So there's that. <laughs> I didn't want to, I probably shouldn't have clicked, pick the best option. Cause I kind of didn't want to keep running MSG every time we do try state, but whatever. Booking meeting. We now have 232 creative energy. Uh, again, I will use that at some point. Locker room incidents. Rocco Rock wants to work for us. You're 44 years old at this point, and I don't know if I would use you if I don't have Johnny Grunge as well. You also have 36 stamina. That's that's bad. Uh, I mean, it's not going down, but that's that's horrible. So it's in, no, I I don't have any use for you. Justice Payne wants to be used tonight. Uh. Boy, your psychology is garbage. A lot of your stuff are garbage. You're basically just a hardcore brawler type. Yeah, n no, no. I'm not interested. Kurt Henning wants to put over Jushin Thunder Liger. Kurt, I think you're a bit too small for the Cruiserweight title. But you know what? I could still at least do the match. So Henning wants to put over Liger at some point in the future. Okay. Dave Finley and Perry Saturn have been hanging out backstage together a lot. So that's cool. Shane Helms and, Shane Helms and Liger have bonded recently. <laughs> uh... In case you haven't been telling, we're trying to slowly get Shane Helms into position for a shot at the Cruiserweight Championship. Currently held by Jushin Thunder Liger. But hey, you know, they bonded recently. That's cool. Uh, also, Liger's been hanging out with Itsuko Mita, who is of Team Canada. Why not? Liger's just befriending everybody backstage. Pay, DDP did... Pre-show training. 
Dusty Rhodes helped create a fun and relaxed atmosphere backstage after finding a discarded karaoke machine and starting an impromptu pre-show competition. Man, we keep finding these karaoke machines at all of our shows, apparently. Booker T came to us backstage with an angle idea. All right. I mean, the one with Flair worked out so well for us. We're going to do team bonding again. Hey, look at that. Jericho and Bigelow, Jericho and Hart, Jericho and Eddie, Jericho and Piper, Booker and Piper, Brent and Sting, Flair and Sting, us and Malenko, Raven and Sting, us and Bigelow, and Austin and Billman. So that's good. That is good. All right. We will see you in just a second for Thunder. Alrighty, and now with Thunder, we have Steve Austin come out to the ring to open up Thunder this week in front of 19,170 people at the Madison Square Garden. He talks briefly, he talks a little bit about his world title defense with Cactus Jack at Spring Stampede. He says that him and Jack fought for the title when Austin won it for the first time, and that he uh, respects Cactus, but he will be retaining it at Spring Stampede. He then brings up what happened on Nitro with Dustin Rhodes, uh, talking about the Dustin Rhodes Roddy Piper promo or segment, whatever. Says that Dustin thinks he should be handling the title shot, but Austin thinks he should be handling an ass kicking instead. So Austin says if Dustin can find a partner at all, then maybe should they, they should have a tag match on Nitro this coming Monday. With the idea being that Cactus Jack, you know, the two respect each other, so they would be teaming up. So it'd be Cactus Jack and Steve Austin versus Dustin Rhodes and whoever. Dustin would get as a tag partner. 97 rating for the segment. Very good stuff there. As uh, Austin's made it clear, he wants to whoop Dustin Rhodes' ass before his uh, title match next Sunday at Spring Stampede. So we'll have to see how that goes out, or how it plays out. Then we have our Women's World Champion, Mumi Osaki, backstage. She's being interviewed by Gene Orkelin, and she laughs off any threat from Megumi Kudo, who mentioned something about you know her on Nitro. Um, or anyone else on the roster. She says that there's two women's matches here tonight on Thunder. No, sorry, there's one women's match tonight here on Thunder, and she doesn't care about it. Uh, she doesn't care about any of the other women in, here in WCW because she's better than them all, including her opponent at Spring Stampede, Medusa. Um, it's going to be a cakewalk for her, and she's looking forward more to the celebration she's going she's to be having after the show. 64-rated segment. Then we have a match. The sees Al Snow defeat Rick Martel in 10 7 by pinfall with a snowplow. Um, Ron Simmons joined the commentary table for the matchup and was kind of talking about Al Snow. Talking about, you know, wanting to know when Snow's going to want his title match. He's got a 69 rating. Nice rating. But Al Snow with the victory here. Getting some more, moment, more momentum for him ahead of his eventual title shot for the television championship. Pretty good stuff there. Then we have Diamond Al's Page and Bam Bam Bigelow coming out to the ring. And uh, they run down the tag team champion, Sting and Barry Windham, for uh, Paige calls them cowards. Says that the only reason why they're defending against the New World Order Spring Stampede is because they know that if they were to fight Bigelow and Paige, that they would lose the titles and get their asses sent to the retirement home. Um, Paige then says he's going to keep an eye on the title match at Spring Stampede very closely. 78 rating. Got the crowd hotter, but it did lose heat for the storyline. Yeah, is what it is. We have an 85 rated segment, <laughs> which is absolutely insane. Uh, but Tracy Smothers is in the ring for a matchup, but out comes the Giant. Uh, Smothers tries a couple forearm shots against the Giant, but Giant just laughs him off before hitting three consecutive choke slams. He then stares down at Smothers before walking, before leaving the ring and walking off, mentioning into the camera that he demands competition. 85 rating for this. Again, just like last week on. Thunder, it's basically just the Giant still demanding some sort of competition and uh, destroying people um, at this point for it. So there's that. We'll have to see what ends up happening with that. So then we have a match that kind of takes place uh, for, you know, it's one of those things where it's like Tracy's Mothers was supposed to face somebody else, but we had to use one of our backup matches, so to speak. And Paul Levesque of the New World Order defeats Rob Van Dam in 746 by Pinball Pedigree. Paul Levesque and Ted DiBiase are a perfect combination. I might need to fix that because I think in the previous game they were a good combination. I'll have to look and see. Uh, 68 rating for the segment. 65 from Paul Levesque, 53 from RVD. So RVD trying to get a little bit of offense in, but Paul Levesque still better at this point. Part of the New World Order. Use it on their hand tactics, all that kind of stuff. Gets the victory. Bret Hart is then standing by backstage. 
and he kind of talks about Cactus Jack getting involved in the New World Order's business. So as a Cactus, you know, he doesn't know why Cactus is getting involved in the New World Order's business, but he, just like everybody else before him, just like Flair and Pillman and Eddie and Two Cold Scorpio and every single person who has been involved, who's tried to stop the New World Order before, will fail as well. He says Cactus even tried to stop the New World Order in the past. He couldn't get it done. He doesn't know why Cactus is trying to do it again this time. Especially because Cactus should be focusing on his world title match at Spring Stampede against Steve Austin. He says one, you know, he doesn't really care who wins that matchup because he will whoop or he will defeat either one of them for that world title. Uh, he just needs to get that opportunity once again and he will be the new WCW World Heavyweight Champion whether anybody around here likes it or not. And then he kind of briefly talks about tonight's main event, which gets announced that it's going to be a six-man tag. It's going to be Cactus Jack, Eddie Guerrero, and Two Cold Scorpio taking on Bret Hart, Jerry Lynn, and Sean Waltman. And Bret says that the New World Order will reign, remain, uh, will reign supreme here tonight and go from there. 98-rated promo. Very good stuff there. Then we got a tag team matchup that sees Big Bob Rogers and Shane Helms defeat Can am Express in 824 when Helms pins Furnace with a bird breaker. A vertebraker that is 63 rating for the match. Really good match rating there for this, honestly. Um, Phil Fon and Doug Fern is pulling off 55s, which is better than I think they did in the previous game. So apparently switching to this game over, it uh, seems to like them a little bit more. Seems to like them. Yeah, that's a better, better uh, in-ring performances a little bit. So that seems to like them a little bit more. But um, the, the kind of storyline with this matchup, is that Big Bob Rogers started off the match. Uh, he ended up sh tagging Shane's Helms in, and then Shane just refused to tag out. Uh, it was one of those things where, like, Rogers was like, hey, you know, tag me in, tag me in. And Shane Helms refused to tag out. Um, and so Rogers was getting pissed while on the apron. 63 rating here afterwards. Damn it, I forgot to put a this stuff here, but basically it was just Big Bob Rogers and Shane Helms kind of get into a, a bit of a verbal argument with each other as Miss York is trying to get them to calm down, uh, essentially is what happened here. Got a 47. Lost heat. Uh, that's what it is. So it looks like even in a victory, Rogers and Helms can't seem to remain on the same page right now. Then we get a 46 rated segment, which I knew was going to happen, but that's fine. As Jesse James Armstrong and Ron Killings are hanging out backstage and talking when Christian Cage and Sexton Hardcastle sh approach them. Uh, Cage and Hardcastle mock the two of them, making fun of Armstrong's family issues, making fun of the fact that, you know, the rest of his family can't seem to appreciate or it doesn't uh, like Jesse James hanging out with Ron Killings. Seems to be this whole, you know, it's almost as if it's like a uh, family rejecting a lover thing and, the, and Christian and Sexton kind of laugh about it. Uh, and after a little bit of back and forth, a tag team match is made for Nitro this week, just for this coming Monday. That is Jesse James Armstrong, Ron Killings versus Sexton Hardcastle and Christian Cage. Then after that, we have a triple threat match in the women's division. And the NWO's Dynamite Kansai defeats uh, Hikari Fuko and Mary Apache in 8.22 when Kansai pinned Hikari with a Splash Mountain. Kansai was head and shoulders above everyone. She had a 60. So... NWO looking strong here uh, as the former women's champion, Dynamite Kensai, who I imagine will also be watching that match with Osaki and Medusa pretty closely at Spring Stampede because, you know, obviously as a former champion, she wants the title back. But she gets a victory here as the New World Order continue to look good so far. Um, Paul Beck won earlier, Dynamite Kensai won just now, so can the, can Brett, Lynn and Waltman make it three for three in the main event tonight. But before we get to that, Ted Biasi is standing by backstage in an office. And it's revealed to be Eric Bischoff's office. Eric Bischoff makes his on-screen return. Uh, of course, he's been out for a few for weeks now after being the recipient of that brain buster and kind of subsequent attack by Eddie Guerrero. Um, after Eddie Guerrero turned down the New World Order. Bischoff says that he wants to know what DiBiase has done about Eddie Guerrero after what happened. DBS then kind of talks about tonight's main event and talks about, you know, Lynn and Waltman getting a victory over him and over Guerrero and Scorpio recently and all that. Bischoff says that's not good enough and he's going to make Guerrero pay for what he's done. 68 rating for the segment. Then we have two cool Scorpio, Eddie Guerrero, and Cactus Jack standing by backstage. And they talk about tonight's main event against the New World Order. 
Um, they say that it's gonna. They know that it's gonna be a hell of a fight against them because they know that the New World Order is full of tactic, full of uh, sneaky tactics, but that they're gonna be able to work together well enough to get the victory. Uh, and then Cactus also kind of briefly talks about how he could be the next, the next WCW World Heavyweight Champion, and mentions about how, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, once they're able to kind of take care of the New World Order, maybe he, uh, you know, as a champion, maybe he'd be willing to give either one of these two youngsters a, a title shot, uh, that kind of thing. I don't always call him youngsters because I think Scorpio might be older than him, but, you know, that's just the way that it's playing out on TV. Um, but yeah, so Cactus kind of talks a little bit about possibly winning the world title, but is he a little too confident? or And is he is his focus a little too stressed, stretched out? He might be too focused on the New World Order right now to be focusing on Steve Austin and the world title. And the main event gets an 84. Oof. What happened here? I'll look at it here in a second. But Sprout that had superb wrestling, great heat. Both sides go to a draw, actually, in 1347, following a double count out. It's one of those things where both teams are just fighting on the outside. Referees can't, you know, everybody can't stop them from fighting. And the refer the match just ends up getting thrown out. Uh, Sean Moleman was a weak link. He had a 74. 83 from Jerry Lynn. 83 from Jerry Lynn. Uh, 94 from Brett, 99 from Cactus, 94 from Eddie, and two, 84 from Scorpio. Wow. Matches are better commentary, so that might have hurt the match some as well. Uh, let's see here. Look at all those positives, too. Brett's declining physically. That sucks. Uh, poor commentary. Yeah, so the commentary brought it down some as well. Plus, it only went 14 minutes. I think that might be... I think maybe if we put it a little bit longer, maybe it would have had a better rating, but that's all right. It is what it is. I'll take an 84. Um, it's probably going to bring the, it's probably going to lose its popularity in some regions, but that's fine. But yeah, so both sides can't, you know, both sides get counted out as it's just a chaotic brawl on the outside to end Thunder this week. 90 rating for the show. Increase our popularity in nine regions. So, hey, we didn't, we didn't lose pro, uh, popularity. That's good. Our promos are definitely carrying us right now, or at least on on this episode of Thunder, our promos definitely carried us though, because we had four promo, we had four segments that were above a ninety, and all four of them were, no, sorry, three segments that were above a ninety, and all three of them were promos. Um, I mean the main event being an eighty four was pretty good still though too. But there you go. So there's uh there's Thunder. We'll look and see. Yeah, we made two million dollars in our finances because of course we did. Popularity-wise, uh, we went up a point in New Zealand. Nice. Get it ever so closely to trying to get everywhere else increased in Australia so we can actually get broadcasted in more than just New Zealand there. Uh, and then Europe went up part of a point. Not a full point, but part of a point at least. So there's that. We will let this load really quick. Uh, and then we'll kind of go over that. I, I know I went through Thunder probably a little bit quicker than I probably should have, but to be fair... No, after recording the different parts of this video, I know that it's going to be a very long video. I'm going to have to do a much better job of trimming it down in the near future. Um, but we'll have to see what is happening with that. Uh, switch over to the recording screen. The recording screen. Switch over to the TW screen, that is. Uh, ratings for the night. 7 million people watching Thunder. So yeah, across the board, yeah, our, our stuff's going to be a little bit lower. But to be fair, that's that's better as well. I, I, you know, it was cool having 10 million people watching our wrestling shows, but to be fair, it also felt kind of slightly out of out of place a little bit. So, um, CML had that happen. So there's that. Uh, CWA ran a show. Dan Severn retained the world title against Ice Train in the main event. That's awesome. <laughs> that, that is awesome. Um, so yeah, there's that. I don't know that there's anything else to bring up. I don't really see anything in these. I mean, obviously there's a lot of articles of like, you know, stuff like that, but that's all from like other, from other companies. Um, Bruce Beefcake, no show to scheduled meeting. So there's that. But yeah, there's uh there's thunder this week. Um, so let me know what you think about having the 
all that stuff at the pre uh, before the show booking. Let me know if you want to see that continue. Um, otherwise, the next episode of this series will be the um, will be the go home week for Spring Stampede 1998, where we'll have to see what other matches get booked for the show. As of right now, we just have the tag titles on the line. Sting and Barry Wyndham defending against Jerry Lynn and Sean Wallman. We have the women's world title on the line. Miyu Miyazaki defending against Medusa. Uh, and we have the world title on the line. Uh, Cactus Jack and Steve Austin fighting for that. Um, we don't have any other matches official for Spring Stampede yet. But uh, I will let you know right now that I do have a full show for that. For uh, I do have a full card for that. Um, so we'll have that. Uh, oh, right, sorry. We also have Brian Pillman and Ric Flair versus Kurt Henning and Jeff Jarrett. I forgot that I made that uh, official for Spring Stampede. Um, so we have that as well. But we will have to see what else possibly gets added to the card. But that's going to do it for us. Thank you for watching. Definitely appreciate it. And we will catch you in the next video.